Greetings, flesh creatures. It is I, Megatron. On behalf of TFYLP, I want to congratulate you for listening to the most refined collector podcast on this miserable little planet Earth. Yes. Here you'll find knowledgeable fans discussing every aspect of Transformers and beyond. Now, enjoy the show while I continue my path to complete conquest of all of you miserable biological entities. Predacons, terrorize! Hi, and welcome to TFYLP. Uh, we have a special episode today. Uh, we have a special guest uh, who just released a book, uh, Jim Sorensen, uh, with us. So uh, we have myself and, uh, and Rick. It, and uh, Rick, I guess, also contributed to the book as well. So uh, we can get into all that. So Howdy. thank you, Jim, Jim for welcome taking to the show. time. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, it's always fun for me to do these sort of things. This is a visual history of the Transformers brand. Of of the there's some epic iconography in this book that okay. is uh, indicative of so many important parts of this brand. Uh, do you want to do you want to tell the listeners and the viewers uh, what what the basics of this uh, ginormous uh, visual history guidebook is well uh in terms of organization um we we wanted to try and cover the entire 35 years, year history of the brand that was that was the brief that we sort of got from hasbro and uh to do that we ultimately wound up breaking it into sort of the largest um the largest components of the brand so we start off with the packaging art transformers being sort of uh, originally and primarily a toy-based franchise. And then we get into comic books, uh, the animation, the video games, and then we end pretty strong on the uh, the film franchise. Uh, now, Jim, for uh, the people at home, uh, I highly recommend this book. Um, I'm sure there's going to be some people who say, well, it doesn't have every single G1 piece of artwork or Beast Wars art." work that there is that's not what this book is well i don't think any book could conceivably be every piece of artwork if you if you did you know each of the pieces of artwork would be you know less than a centimeter square right uh, Abs and absolutely that that'd be you know unless you could click on them and they got big and then that's not a book that's that's some kind of you know web application that we that we'd have to invent but um you know i Leaving aside that it would be impossible to collect every piece of art, I think that you wouldn't be able to, if you had every piece of art, then there wouldn't really be any context to it, right? I, I think part of the value of a book like this is the curation process. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you want to be able to flip through and say, oh, this is what the packaging art looks I remember this piece. Oh, I've never seen this one before. This one's cool. You want that experience when you're handling the book. And I don't think that um, you know, it, it's different than something like uh, you know, the Transformers Legacy packaging art book that, that we did because you know, that one we aimed for comprehensive. We really wanted everything. And I think there's value to that too, uh, especially when you can narrow your focus. Um, but, but this isn't that experience. You know, right. it, was, it was never intended to be. It's, it's and the, that's the point. That's the point I'm trying to make, that they're two very different books. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I think every, every book we do is its own project, its own voice. It has its own parameters, scope. And tone, and and you want to honor the material in the way that makes sense for the material. So you know, Transformers animated, um, very whimsical, the art style, the storytelling style. You know, we when we wanted to present that material, we did it in a whimsical way. We did it. You know, we called it the Almanac, which is already a bit of a goofy title. You know, it's different than. Um, the arc, which we, we call the compendium, because that was a little more serious, you know, a little less, a little more dry in some ways. You know, you know, here here are the character designs, front and back, you know, vehicle and robot or, or beast and robot, 
you know, let's take a look at what those are. It, this book, being a visual history, it is a history. You know, this is saying, well, what, what was going on in, in 84 or 96 or 2007? You know, the, these are important years for the brand, and we wanted to be able to cover everything, at least uh, to some to some depth. You know, not to the same depth that we do if we were doing, you know, the dedicated Prime book, you know, The Art of Prime. That's everything for the Prime cartoon. But, um, you know, again, this this couldn't be that. But it doesn't need to be that because The Art of Prime exists. And if you want that, you can you can go buy it, hopefully. It's a, probably a little expensive on the secondary market. But it, it's out there. And, um, you know, so we cover Prime. Prime gets you know, probably about eight pages in the animation section and a couple of pages of um, of the package art. And, you know, I think that lets you get a, a feel for Transformers Prime. So let me let me just interject there. Jim says eight pages, right? But you got to remember, this is over 400 pages <laughs> of high gloss, high quality paper. So when you're when you're flipping through this book, I mean, every page it is just uh, bewilderment <laughs> and uh, and quality. And there's there's a couple of things. You know, you talked about uh, what was going on in each year in regards to the packaging, and you, and you hit on those things uh, at the beginning of each chapter. Um, but there's there's a there's a few things I wanted to point out. Um, look at this. It's stuff like this which you don't often see in books. This is the unused uh, art for. Uh, Universe, uh, Energon, Megatron. So it's it's stuff like that that only a book that's formatted in this way would realistically feature something like that. Well, well and, and for the listeners, uh, you know that that may not know. So Jim, this is your is this your twelfth book, I believe, and you roundabout, yeah, somewhere. <laughs> It depends on how you count them, because sometimes you do a collected volume, and is that a new book, or is that, you know, just two old books put together, you know, but but depending on the count, let's say roughly a dozen. And so each of those books that you've done previously, a lot of those go into a lot more detail again, like we said, the, uh, the legacy book with the G1 art, and the prime book, and the animation books, and things like that. So again, a lot of those are still available on Amazon. And I do want to mention, I believe, uh, are they republishing the Transformers Legacy book as well? I noticed on Amazon that they're taking new pre-orders for that. They are. Uh, IDW is coming out with a uh, paperback version of it. The original one was hardcover. So this one's uh, a little bit smaller and a little bit lighter. So if you want to use it as reference or, or you know carry it to a convention, it's not quite as onerous. A little bit smaller uh, in terms of the dimensions. The page count is the same. And... Um, yeah, so so you can get that again, which is good because for a while that book was going for you know ninety, a hundred, hundred and twenty bucks. So um, it's it's one hundred and fifty eight dollars nice. right now on Amazon. Oh boy, so it's it's nice it's nice you know on the one hand it makes me a little proud when I see oh there's enough demand that people are interested in in paying this much for the books. On the other hand, I kind of want people to be able to read them for a reasonable price, and you right. know I don't see any of any any of the markups so you know when whenever idw does do a, a second or a third printing it's always a bit of cause for celebration absolutely and i think so that new book i think it's it's a little bit less expensive so uh, i believe the visual history the msrp on that is uh fifty dollars um which you you know may be able to find that on sale you know on amazon and whatnot um and then the uh the Legacy book, I believe, I think it's thirty dollars that paperback version. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's right. So I think I think the nice thing about that is is a couple different price points. So that way, if you have a Transformers fan and you're trying to figure out what to buy them for Christmas, and I know a lot of us, like myself included, that it's like I have a million toys and you don't even, you know, it's like my wife doesn't know what toys that I you know, have and don't have and whatever, but I, I feel like... You got the wrong star screen, not that one. <laughs> right. Right, not Cyberverse, come on. And, and so th that's why I feel like th that these books are really great for, for somebody that if you're trying to find something to buy them that's Transformers related, that you can get this, and then there's a couple different things. And I know, 
you know, Jim, I had told you before about the, this Transformers Legacy. I think I told you at the con that um, I bought the, you know, originally and my my son and I, we went through this. And that's how he learned about Transformers when he was from like the ages of three all the way up till five that he we would go through the book together every night before he we went to bed and read about the different Transformers and and, and look at the art of of legacy and so that was a good way that he kind of learned about uh you know how to read um as well too when he was first learning to read that you know just looking at the different names and everything and the package art and i I mean it was a really great way because you know i personally don't have every g1 figure and so it's it's great to be able to go through all of this and, and go through it with him so that the things that he can see on the uh, when he was watching the cartoon that he can also see, you know, kind of the toy art and, and all that type of thing, too. So I would, I would definitely highly recommend this book. You know what? That is a, that is a wonderful story, Lucas. You should leave that as a review. That's a wonderful <laughs> story. I want to talk about this real quick, Jim. Oh, sure. So this uh, was uh, one of the prides and joys of my uh, time at Hasbro. Um, I'm wondering, did you get this? Did you photograph the original when you were up there visiting me or uh, how did you get, how did you come across that? Uh, I think that was part of the asset, um, the asset dump that Hasbro provided to Viz while we were working on this. I don't think this one came out of my own archives. Okay. So, uh, I remember you visited me one time. I I don't remember if that was there. So this is by, this is for anyone listening. This is the, uh, was it fall of Cybertron? Uh, Bruticus done in G2 colors that was available as an Amazon exclusive. And the box came in a retro G2 box. Um, That was a great piece. I brought in my old uh, green tank Megatron from G2. We scanned it in. We recreated all the elements because we didn't have them. And then I tracked down an artist called Larry Salmon who had done a lot of work for Hasbro. And I'm like, do it in the way we did it before you were drawing in like joints and stuff like that. So he took this and he did his own interpretation of what of what that Bruticus would look like. So this is not I would say this is not toyetic. This is this is uh inspir- inspired by. And I'm so glad to see this in the book because it, there's only a little bit it's it's very cropped on the packaging. So I love to see this full piece uh, in the book. This this piece of art, this was an actual painting that he did, and it's about four feet tall. Wow. Oh, wow. I wish I knew the uh, the artist's name when I was putting the book together. I could have put a credit in. I, I Hey, uh, second edition. Yeah, right? Second edition. Hit me up. <laughs> so there, there's so much in this. I mean, there's robots in disguise. There, there's Cyberverse. There's... I mean, even recent stuff like the Bumblebee movie, and then yeah, you have stuff. Uh, they include all six movies. I, I mean, you have you have great stuff in here, like the uh, Transformers fan club stuff, uh, like the Piranacon. I think that's the first time that Piranacon from the Transformers Collectors Club has been seen anywhere without being cropped. So you know, you have no idea how much time and was spent on just recreating this foot here and then that foot didn't even get it onto the packaging (laughs) (laughs) no it's crazy and that's one of the joys of doing these sort of art books is getting the getting the pieces out there and and we have high standards for ourselves we don't use pieces um you know generally speaking we weren't scanning off packages or or anything like that we were only working you know, from the originals or, you know, photo negatives, if it's a really old piece, maybe. But, um, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's neat to be able to showcase some of that. And, and just to back up a little bit about, you know, most people don't have every G1 Transformer. You know, when I was doing Legacy, one of the joys to me was, um, in some ways, it replaces my toy collection. It's like, in my mind, it, it checks off the box of, well, now I have Fangry, you know? I don't, um, I, I, I do have the Fangry toy somewhere in a box, not displayed, but, you know, this is the sort of my Fangry that I can go to and look at whenever I want. And it was, it was 
satisfying for me to be able to sort of collect all of them in that format. You know, again, this book, uh, Visual History, being a less comprehensive book, doesn't um, scratch that itch, but it does sort of allow me to now say, oh, well, you know, I've worked on, you know, or, or, or I've done work with Transformers Cyberverse. I've done work with rescue bots, you know, um, it's, it's cause it does have, it doesn't have everything, everything, but you know, it has just about as much as, as we could acquire and showcase. So, uh, we've talked about packaging art, uh, beyond that, we've mentioned that, um, uh, these would be called, uh, licensing images from the films that you know, they usually come on a CD, you send it to a, a licensor, they put it on a lunchbox, on a backpack, on a sticker, um, beyond all that great stuff, you've got toy designs in here. We do. Yeah. Those are, those are neat to feature as well. I mean, we didn't, we didn't have a ton of them, but, uh, we had some of the ones, you know, from back in the eighties and, um, you know, we put them between the comics and the, the toy package art because that, that seemed like a, a logical spot for them. But uh, not only did we have the designs, but we also had sort of all the um, uh, all of the uh, elements that we're, we're, we're talking about what the designs were. So, you know, the approval stamps and the handwritten notes and the the dates and the serial numbers and all that stuff, you know, we, we were able to preserve that. And I thought that was kind of neat to uh, need to show off, you know, and then sometimes you could see that the, the designs, you know, that, that showed up later in uh, you know, things like the, the Marvel um, universe uh, bio books that they did way back in the day, were reusing some of this art. And then sometimes some of this art just looks, you know, really, kind of freaky and cool like the pretenders came out really well you have a nice skull grin in there or, or again uh you know back to back to fangry he looks you know sort of like a legitimately scary cyber werewolf creature you know so, so tell uh, me how do you uh what's your process in compiling this uh art is it is it mainly with hasbro or do you have other uh, people that you're working with to kind of compile that from personal collections or, or what? Well, Hasbro provided a large data dump um, that sort of got us kicked off. So we were not starting from nothing. Um, and But once we had that, I went through and I identified, you know, what the gaps were, what would be nice to feature that we didn't have. And then I started uh, going through my own archives, which are fairly extensive by this point, and then hitting up people like Rick and Aaron, who used to work at Hasbro, and hitting up the artists and hitting up other collectors who were interested in material like that, and just just trying to make sure that there there weren't too many gaps. Like the um, uh, the Unicron trilogy wasn't something that Hasbro had a lot of in their archives, so I was I was. Definitely banging on on Rick's door, you know, saying, you know, you, you got to get me something from uh, from Energon. I need I need I need Energon packaging. Yeah, really, you know, uh, I don't have any. Well, well, who worked on it? I don't know, Dan Kana. All right, Dan, what do you got for me? So, um, you know, that that's kind of the 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 process. It's it's what they have and and what I can dig up and what I can dig up can vary pretty wildly from um, you know from from property to property. Especially depending on how old it is. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think it's amazing. Like, you know, because I know, Rick, you've touched on this before that a lot of this stuff, I mean, to Hasbro, it's just toys and they're not really into, you know, keeping the archives and the history as much. I think that they're probably more aware of that now that the brand is 35 years old. But, you know, probably back in the day, they're pitching a lot of the, the stuff, right? Uh, unfortunately, after I had left, a lot of the stuff ended out ended up being pitched um but that's a story for another day uh i want to focus on jim's book that you even have angry birds transformers referenced in this <laughs> book so i mean this is just like th this is just a good textbook for anyone who who doesn't know anything about transformers so you get a new marketing person on the team you show them this book and they they can kind of go through the history and and get it a feel of the different eras in this book um, I wanted to ask you about some of the comic images in here. But before we do that, let me just say Angry Birds was actually something I fought for. Really? 
Well, you know, I did the um, I did the hardcover um, art of the Angry Birds movie book. So, you know, I, I, I kind of had some of the relationships over at Rovio. So when we were doing the video game section, um, originally we had a two page spread of Angry Birds and uh, the editors at Viz uh, didn't care for it because you know, it's not as nice as some of the other uh, imagery in the book and from an objective sense. And I was interested in it maybe more from a, a historical perspective and they were coming at it more from the visual perspective. But we, um, I, I managed to keep it in where was it in the was it in the homage section or the I, uh, I mis- miscellaneous I think it was in miscellaneous yeah but it but it, it stayed yeah okay yeah there it is um no where it is well it, it it's I I kept one of the images in there somewhere so I want to I'm pretty sure yeah I just flipped through it I I it's don't right. know where it was um I just caught my eye I'm like you know there's a little bit of everything in here. Hmm. So I wanted to just ask your what your process was because you have a lot of comic book covers in here which are great pieces of art, but then you have uh, specific panels laid out from the comic book eras. So are these from books that you treasured or are these just interesting pieces of art? Were these things that other people recommended to you? How do you go – there's so much art in the world of Transformers. How do you go and say I want the page from that book? it featured here well so some of it was stuff that had a particular um emotional significance to me uh page 131 we didn't set out to do this it it was something that came back from our designer but i immediately noticed it uh page 131 is in the comic section it's late marvel u.s stuff uh so i own the original piece of art for all three of those so i thought you know Again, I didn't. I didn't say go do this. Our, our our process was we identified pieces that belonged in certain areas of the book and gave them to our designer and let him play around with them. And, th- and he came back with this sort of the Jim Lee one on the left and these three by Jeff and, and Andrew on the right. But the the fact that I, I had all three of those, you know, kind of immediately made it privately significant. And then I didn't let them touch the page again. Um, so things like the, the, we are Thunderwing. Yeah, I remember but it's also an iconic piece, you know, that, that was, you know, right at the climax of the matrix quest arc from back mm. in the eighties. And it's important on that level, you know, things like Optimus prime, you know, page 128, you know, just, uh, one page earlier, um, Optimus prime blowing up because he lost in a video game and that's what honor demanded. Um, you know, th- that's just such an important moment in the Transformers history that I wanted to showcase that. So, and sometimes it was something that um, someone else recommended. I reached out to the various artists um, who, who were sort of in my Rolodex and asked them for recommendations in terms of the pieces that they thought they were the most proud of. So, um, you know, some of the ones in there, uh, I'm kind of rapidly scrolling through. Um, you know, we have a, a, a page that's a two page spread of, of Livio artwork from the chaos uh, plot line that ended the, um, the, the first IDW ongoing transformers book. And um, at least one of those, you know, they're, and they're, they're interior panels. And I, you know, some of them were ones that I said, Oh yeah, I, I, I remember this piece. I really love. Yeah. At least one of them was one where Livio said, Oh yeah, I was really proud of, of this piece. And I think we should feature that. It might, I think it might be the, the top one on, uh, on 172. It was one where he said, "Oh, this is this is one that I worked on, and and I'd like to showcase." This, and then, you know, speaking of that page on page one seventy three, you have the armored up Megatron, which is a figure that I tried to push to get done. <laughs> uh, it was the ATV uh, bomber with extra armor to make the bomber wings even longer, and then in robot mm-hmm. mode, it would armor him up, and we ended up just putting out a little deluxe. That's all. Uh-huh. That's all I was able to get out of it. That, that kind of reminds me of the old, um, you know, the old Macross Valkyrie approach, you know, like like the Jetfire figure where you have the baseline figure, but then you you pile the yeah. armor up and, and it works differently. Yeah. In different I was pushing uh, for a leader class and then the other figure would have been Ultra Magnus, of course, with with the transforming cab and then the armor. And and, and yeah. now they did it. They finally did it. Rick. And now they've 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 put it out. I'm, I'm happy it's it's available. Yeah. But, you know, with IDW. 
there were so many iconic moments that weren't necessarily what showed on the cover that I think we had to go inside. You know, I mean, the, the covers are always easy to do because they're always beautiful and um, and and they they have their own sort of charm. But but by by definition, a cover is usually sort of a distillation of what's going on in the story. Whereas the interior panels, those are sort of the specific moments. It's like the difference between the Transformers, uh, the movie poster, you know, the sort of classic Star Wars-y rip-off poster, and, you know, one of the iconic still frames, you know, like, you know, Optimus Prime in the air with the sun behind him. You know, they serve different purposes, but you want both to be things that you can, um, that you can showcase over the course of the book. There you go, you found it. So oh, and- in uh, homage, you can homage. find Angry Birds if you're if yeah. you're curious. <laughs> well, I, I I fought for it and I and I got it in there. And I remember even saying something as specific as if we don't get the Angry Birds piece of art into the book, I have to rewrite the video game introduction because I'm not referencing a property that's not in the book. You know, we're you know unless I specifically am saying, but we're not including which we didn't do. But you know, we we didn't talk about there there weren't many parts of the property. Uh, the franchise we couldn't get uh, or weren't allowed to to touch but you know the the very few that fell into that category weren't ones that we spent a lot of time talking right. about. yeah i but, noticed there's no kiss players in this no well actually th- there's not a whole lot from uh japan this century you know i my archives aren't too bad for the early stuff but um you know there's there's not really much if any of the new stuff, and that's just because that's not something that um, you know that Hasbro was able to um, to, to provide. So, um, in the animation section, I'm, I'm I'm just going over this. You have uh, character designs from G1. Uh, I'm looking at all the beautiful art from Beast Wars and Beast Machine, and it's so nice to actually like have them against a white background. Where you can just really like look and and see exactly everything that's going on in the design of those characters. Yeah, um, those... and and you know what? I've I've been around for a long time. I, I mean, I look like I'm fifty. I'm actually forty. <laughs> uh, but I've been around for a long time, and there's a ton of stuff in this book that I've never seen before. Well, you know, there's stuff that I've never seen before. Uh, you know, stuff that that Hasbro provided that. You know, was brand new to me. Yeah, yeah. Some of that um, <clears throat> Unicron trilogy packaging art, the, um, the 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 pieces from Energon that that showcase the um, combination feature, the power linksing. You know, that wasn't something that I had seen, and I thought it was it was really neat to be able to um, to find it and then to to showcase it. You know, I mean, I, it's certainly one of the joys for me in putting together a book like this is just finding out that there's new stuff that, that I didn't even know had existed. Uh, so talk to me about the cover. What, what was the process in, in doing that? Um, the, this, is the, this is the standard edition one. It's got Optimus on the front, Megatron on the back. Um, what, is it just because the movie is the, they're so prominent for the, for the brand? Or? You know, I, I, I'd only be speculating because the, uh, the cover – design wasn't um, a decision that I was really um, taking a, a whole lot of, uh, given a whole lot of input into, you know, that was something that the Viz design team came up with. Um, but I, and this is really more speculation than anything else. I would guess it's because, um, you know, we're, we're trying to grab eyeballs, you know, we're, we're trying to get people who are browsing through Barnes and Nobles uh, and, and looking at an end display to pick it up. And, those, you know, the, the, to try and reach that mass market, you want to hit the parts of the brand that are going to be most resonant to them. And I think, I think realistically, it's going to be the movie section that's going to be that. So here's, here's a technical question. Uh, you've got some screen grabs of the old uh, Famicom game and, and stuff. Uh, how did you get those? Uh, so I got an uh, an emulator, and I was able to run the game, and then I took screen captures. And then uh, well, one of the interesting 
challenges was when I tried to drop them into the book, Photoshop immediately wanted to start smoothing them over. And I had to go digging and it wasn't too hard, but I had to go and find an online tutorial about how to make it not do that and how to turn off the setting that, you know, that tries to make it look nice. I'm like, no, 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 guys, that, that's <laughs> not a bug. That's a feature. I, I want to, I want to see it exactly the way it looks. And, and although obviously it's blocky and they're, literally only using 16 colors in any given frame, it actually looks also kind of nice, you know, especially in the context of, what, 1984, 1985, when this game would have come out. But but even now, you know, I have it blown up on my screen, you know, it, it, it sort of has a weird charm to it to see that part of the story that we'd seen in More Than Meets the Eye and that we'd seen in Marvel issue number one retold in this you know, sort of slightly, you know, primitive early days of the art form video game. I liked, I liked that one. I, I, I was happy there. Uh, I, my, my one regret is that we couldn't get the, um, um, the Activision cover a little bit bigger. I mean, that, that's as big as we could do it and have it look good because, you know, it was, it was printed on a cassette, you know, I mean, the original, not the original, the original is a painting. I have no idea how big it is. But, you know, it's probably about two or three feet by two or three feet. It could be even bigger. But um, but in terms of what was published, it was tiny. So when you scan it in, there's all kinds of printing artifacts. So I, I wanted to cover it because oddly, most of the games from that era didn't go in for, you know, fancy paintings. They mostly sort of went with computer e-graphics from the 80s. So they, they didn't look good and we didn't feature them. You know, the other one that, that really had their own painting was the, the Japanese game. But there there we had, a, you know, a, a better, bigger, cleaner version of to use. So, you know, that's a little bit more prominent in the book. But I would have loved to have, you know, had I access to the original painting or, or a photo negative of that original artwork. I would have loved to have a nice full page spread of that, but you know, you, you're limited by the, um, the logistics of what you have. You know, you go to the, you go to war with the army. you have. So, uh, well, um, uh, r- real quick. Um, there, so there's a couple of different versions. Uh, uh, what is the difference between the regular one that Lucas and I have been showing and, and the deluxe version? All right. Uh, well, the, the big difference is the deluxe version uh, comes in a uh, slipcase, which is really pretty nice, um, and it, it opens up. And then the um, and on the the cover of the slipcase is a very simple silver reflective Autobot and Decepticon symbol. You know, uh, very elegant, looks great. And then you open it up, and instead of the Optimus on the front and Megatron on the back, it's a lenticular cover, so it's Optimus literally transforming into Megatron. Uh, and then the third difference is that it comes with five prints, which are, I think, pretty nice. They're, they're prints of you, I should have to say. Yeah, well, they're five prints. There's five <laughs> headshots. Right. I have a different hat in each one. No, you right, know, right. We, we, we tried to pick one from uh, the different sections of the book. I, I don't think we wound up doing anything... Oh no, we did. Um, we had we had the um, uh, the Transformers Japanese movie poster for the animation. Uh, you know, we had the um, um, the War for Cybertron poster. Um, we had the um, the the Transformers Marvel number no. five Shockwave. You know, the Transformers are all dead. Mm. Um, uh, we had the Bumblebee uh, sort of lounging uh, from the Bumblebee movie to represent the films. And then we had a piece of uh, Siege packaging art, the Band of Brothers piece that's sort of really cool. You know, so some of them are land, uh, landscape and uh, some of them are portrait. But, uh, yeah, I thought that was that was a nice a nice touch. And I had a lot of input into which pieces we had. I think it was important to us that we, um, we represent um, each section, each of the major sections of the book, and then um, I wound up compiling a short list of, you know, uh, two to four pieces for each section and then shot that off to my editors. And then they they narrowed it down and we ran it by Hasbro and got their input. So, you know, it's it very much a collaborative process. And I'm really happy with um, you know, the choices. And, and, and that goes not just for the prints, but just in general for the way we came at the book. You know, it, it um, I, I was the one who was sort of guiding the curatorial process, but I had 
I had the input from Hasbro and I had my input from the editors at Viz to, uh, you know, to try and make sure other voices were represented, which is good because um, I think I think my instinct would be to lend lean a little bit more heavily into the history. And I think by having some other voices that maybe weren't coming at it from a place of, of fandom, they were coming at it from a place of, you know, what's the aesthetic value of these pieces? They could sort of say, well, you know, all else being equal, I think this is just objectively a nicer piece, you know, and we wanted, we wanted the iconic pieces represented. And I think we achieved that, but we also wanted to be, you know, like Marvel number one cover. We had to have that piece in there. We had to have it in there prominently, but then for the, the sort of mid tier stuff, it's good to have some of them that, Oh yeah, I remember that piece. And then other ones of, Oh, like we have a really big um, stripes from Titans return. You know, that's not an important character. That's not one that I would say, Oh, that, that stuck is- out to me. It stuck yeah, out to me. And when you look at what's across the page from that, you have overlord, uh, you've got a, you got a headmaster and I'm like, well, I could see overlord should probably be more prominent. Uh, but then yeah. you look at the actual piece itself yeah, and, look- uh, I never noticed in the, in the broken glass that's shattering around him, you see all the little faces of all the little, all the, all the, all the other, uh, robots around him. Yeah. That, things like that are really nice touches, but also, you know, that, that overlord piece as with, you know, a lot of the Titans return artwork, it's, it's a robot sort of standing like this with his head coming up. And it's, it's actually a very static piece aside from, from the head popping off, which, which then would be repeated again and again and again as a motif. So, you know, the, whereas the stripes piece is actually quite dynamic and, you know, that's not the kind of choice that I would immediately gravitate towards. So having other people in the room to say, Oh, maybe we should, maybe we should make this lion leaping through glass really huge because it's an awesome piece just on its own, you know, it, it, it lets the book have more, more visual variety as you flick through. And I, I think that's an important, you know, that, that's something that we struggled with when we were doing legacy was to have the visual variety because we didn't want the pieces to all feel the same. And I think one of the ways that Bill Forster, who, who worked with me on that book and, and did all the, all the design choices, um, one of the things he was able to do was was give a sense of momentum just by sort of having the backgrounds evolve much the same way the backgrounds evolved on the packages through the years. But it, it gives you a sort of subconscious sense of, of progress. And so you, you don't ever feel like you're trudging through it. And then with this book, that was much less of an issue because you had such variety, even within a given section, even within like packaging art, packaging art for Titans Return is very different than packaging art for Prime or the films or G1. You know, and, and, and having the different or, or, or the Unicron trilogy or, you know, or any of the various packaging that we did siege, you know, they each have their own um, their own visual identity. So it made our lives easy to be able to just let that evolving aesthetic pull the reader along rather than to have to sort of artificially, you know, give them a shove. And that's not just packaging art. That's everything. I mean, you know, even even within the IDW section, which is the longest section in the book, IDW's artwork definitely um, changed sensibilities from you know the early Furman days of of the Asian series to the uh, Costa era to the you know early Roberts and Barber, you know to the you know crossover stuff, revolutions. You know, it it, it that helps pull you along. And then, of course, there's the other publishers. You know, Dreamwave has its own style. Marvel US and UK have their own style. So I, I think that's fun. And certainly, certainly each of the cartoons has its own voice. Is there anything from any particular era you wish you had a lot more of in the book? I wish we had more Unicron trilogy just in general. You know, um, I wish we had more of the packaging art. We We just barely, I think have enough. You know, I, I think we adequately do the Unicron trilogy. I, I wish we had a greater selection on the back end of pieces to choose from, but I think we devote about the right amount of space to that. I don't think we need more space. It would have been nice if we had um, our pick of choices rather than, you know, oh, we managed to find Demolisher's art. Well, that's great. He's an important character. You know, it's... it's. Um, 
it's not the piece of Unicron trilogy art I necessarily would have gone with if I had had all of them. But you know, but it it works. But then on the on the cartoon side, in terms of production documents or promotional documents, we just didn't have very much at all. So they, they only wound up with with two pages. You know, the robots, uh, the car robots from Japan, which was robots in disguise. Here we we went with the car robots branding just because of confusion. Because uh, mm-hmm. obviously there's there's a much newer cartoon also called Robots in right. disguise, <laughs> and, and, and nothing else relevant to this book called Car Robots. But, uh, you know, we only wind up having a page of um, the animation models there. And then that's an important series that I would have liked to have given, you know, at the very least, a two page spread to. It's the Lost series it's yeah. because I it's mean, in uh, it's in the rights limbo of who can release it. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's got its uh, it, its own challenges there. But uh, I would have been happy to give them two pages. You know, I could have seen my way to three or four, although even with the 408 pages we had to play with, you know, we were constantly bumping up against our page count and having to, you know, you know, cut two here if we want to insert two there. I mean, every everything we included, we, we had a reason for. We thought it was something that was important or interesting or the series itself needed to be acknowledged. Yeah, just to, just out of curiosity, you know, if if you take the t- what you totally packaged together, were there a lot more pages that you had to, you know, shrink down the number of pages, or uh, could could you clarify? I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Well, um, so as far as like the uh, the amount of information you're talking about, the editing process, did you have a lot more, you know, um, material that you would have liked to have included in the book that you had to cut out? I could have made this book twice as long, uh, other than physics. You know, you, I mean, 800 page books exist, but you know, they're awkward. Um, but, but in terms of the material we had, yeah, I, I could have easily gotten a lot bigger, but in terms of what we actually created and then snipped very little, uh, most of those sort of struggles were done in the spreadsheet stage of the book, mm. you know, in the, you know, in our mind's eye of figuring, okay, well, we'll, we'll devote this much page to that. I mean, once the pages were laid out, there were a few that we, you know, that that we thought would look good, and then they came back, and you know, they were okay, but you know, maybe not quite up to the high standards of the rest of the book. And we said, okay, well, in retrospect, we could lose this, or something where you know there was some sort of strategic issue that we said, oh, well, we can't, we can't use that piece, you know, it's got a Target logo on it, you know, let's let's just not. Uh, <laughs> Let's just not try and 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 tackle that problem. And you know, when we have other pieces that are perfectly good, um, but uh, you know, mostly mostly those sort of agonizing choices were made before we had somebody lay out the pages. You know, you, you don't want to do a lot of work that that then gets wasted. That makes sense. Uh- um, so I noticed uh, your previous books were published by IDW, and I know this one was uh, was published by Viz. What was uh, the the process with with that? Uh, did you pitch it to them? Did they pitch it to you? As far as uh, coming up with the book, uh, they actually contacted me. Um, so uh, so IDW, I've I've done you know like quite a, quite a few books with. Uh, and I, I still have a great relationship with them. In fact, I'm talking to them about sort of other projects that we might be doing in, in 2020 or, or 2021, depending on you know scheduling and 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 what what makes sense from Hasbro's perspective. But um, yeah, Viz reached out to me and they said, you know, we're we're working on this Transformers Visual History book with Hasbro. Uh, we don't have anybody in house that has expertise. Is this something you'd be interested in doing? And I said. Are you the same Viz that that did Ronmo and Half? And they said, "Yep, yeah, that, that's us." I said, "Oh, I, I'm fans of you guys. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to work with you." And and um, you know, I uh, you know looped in my agent and got all the sort of uh, logistics details ironed out, and then you know, sort of off to the racetracks. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Well, I I know this is just a you know a wonderful book that spans you know pretty much the entire history. So I think it's, it's great that this is coming out for the 35th anniversary. I think it's, it's a wonderful textbook. That's how, that's how I look at this. If there was a class in transformers history at a university, 
this this would be one of the books assigned. So. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, it, it's not a, a, a uh, verbiage heavy book. You know, we 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 spend time at the beginning of each chapter talking about you know sort of how the cartoons evolved, how the the film franchise evolved. But um, you know, we 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 mostly let the images speak for themselves other than you know who who did them if we had that information and 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 what they are but um but yeah i I think this is one that that hopefully you would um you would be able to come at from a perspective of oh well what is important about the transformers brand you know what, what what is certainly it gives you the feel i think of the various parts of the brand you know what 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 is titan's return all about well it's about these these heads popping on and off and and you know what's you know how is that different than than transformers pro oh, transformers prime is brooding and menacing and has gravitas you know it's and it's not quite the same as, as transformers animated where people are having fun or, or or the you know the new robots in disguise cartoon i i love the um the images we we chose for robots in disguise you know the uh, let's see what page is that? That's on uh, 270 to 271 because we we'd already done a couple of the character. You know we had character models up and down this book because yeah, you know, one of the core elements that you have when you're creating one of these shows. But then with robots in disguise, we had all these sort of whimsical images with uh, you know uh, pizza pies and and Grimlock in disguise as a construction vehicle and pie in the face and incognito. I mean you know, these are just fun, you know. Bunny yeah, slippers. Around. Yeah, the sideswipe image with the bunny slippers is great. <laughs> and you know, just the page before on two two sixty nine, you know, the 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 rescue bot sketches. I said, yeah, I, I that really feels like rescue bots to me. You know, we have the character models of the page before, but but two sixty nine is really the the. One, I'm really proud of this page, and it's such a simple page, but it has so much emotion to it. Well, and and I know too that you know we have such amazing resources online like tf wiki and whatnot and those are all very heavy with uh you know the story and and whatnot but they don't have these images that you know the images they do have are very small and, and whatnot so i think that you know this is one of those things to where i feel like this is a there's a really neat coffee table book that you can pick up you can look up and then you know if you if you do want to you know find out more it's like you kind of use it hand in hand with uh, you know, some of the resources online. Well, you know, I, I think that these books in general exist comfortably side by side with the sort of various websites and, and fan efforts. You know, the, the, the wiki is a great resource and it, it's very good at what it wants to be, but it doesn't want to be a gallery. But even the things that want to be a gallery, you know, if, you, if you're interested in the box art, um, you know, you can go to, to Box the Crab and, and you can see that artwork online. But does that supplant the need for something like legacy? In my opinion, it doesn't because, you know, it's it's always going to be a website. And, you know, they're only going to be so big and, you know, you're not you're not going to be holding it in your hand. That, you know? that or maybe tactile you are, feel is important. Yeah. And that's why I but mentioned it, the glossy it, paper. It, yeah, it, it's a whole experience. And, you know, not to be fair, websites are too, but it's a different experience, not necessarily better or worse, just – a different experience for a different medium, different goals, different strengths. Well, yeah, and I think beautiful. I mean, the, you know, I worked on some of these films, and there's art in here that I've never seen before. So, th this is just—it's so nice to have this. Yeah, the the film section I think is one that came out particularly nice, and and it was one that I was at least somewhat concerned with because of that visual variety I was talking about, and I, I wasn't sure that the evolution from one to five necessarily would would pop on the page in the same way but the the nice thing there is that we had enough variety of, of types of material you know we weren't relying just on the character designs or just on the movie posters or just on the kind you know but we had sort of all those elements together so you can you can have you know page 352 and have the character design for the first movie but then a couple pages earlier you know 348 349 we have this beautiful two-page spread of of the posters i mean i now, love that i've not really out. seen a whole lot of skids and mud flap except for one little image well they're in there 
<laughs> They're on page 358. So. I, I see. That's the one little image. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you, you, you found it. I mean, but, you know, they, 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 we featured different characters sort of depending on, on how prominent the character. Like, one of the very late minute um, changes to the book came when Hasbro said, oh, we want to expand the siege section by two. But we had to cut something else you know, for, for some unrelated reason. And they said, well, well, let's let's beef up the siege of Cybertron section because that's, you know, War for Cybertron siege. You know, that's uh, something we're really proud of and we'd like to showcase that art. And I was like, okay, you know, good choice. Um, and and I was privately lamenting how little Starscream we had in the book. You know, we, we had Starscream, but we didn't have a whole lot of full page spreads of him the same way we did with you know bumblebee or grimlock or Soundwave, and uh i said we can kill two birds with one stone here you know let's let's do a two-page spread of sound wave uh, of starscream you know we'll put his robot mode on one side and his his vehicle mode on the other and we didn't actually have the starscream robot uh artwork in hand and we were you know, late enough in the game that we were really trying to you know, to refrain from doing a whole lot of unnecessary asset requests. But I said, no, but this, this one's worth it. You know, I have a vision in my head. It's going to look really great. Let's ask for it. We asked for it. We got it. And 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 now page 106, 107 is, is, you know, one of my favorites in the book. Unfortunately, I have a lot of favorites in the book, but but it's one of them. And, you know, it, it, it achieved what Hasbro wanted, which is showcasing some of their newest artwork. It achieved what I wanted, which was to, you know, get a little bit more Starscream into the book. And, you know, it it, um, it it was a little bit of serendipity. But, you know, it, there were many places where if we did have to make a change, we'd try to kill two birds with one stone and say, well, yeah, if we have to change X, you know, we're a little light on Beast Wars. So let's let's bump up Beast Wars by two if we're losing two pages out of some other section. Well, uh, as I said, you know, I, I was just flipping through this again, and, and just to have all the movie characters against a white background, for those people who don't have uh, the license guide sitting around their basement, uh, it's so nice to, to be able to see the full character and see all the intricate designs that went into each and every movie character. Or, or see see designs for guys we've never seen before, like on 388, you've got the, uh, the Cheetor design. Yes, uh, you know, something that uh, has been talked about a little bit and uh but uh you know there he is uh so uh you know i remember uh what his place was in the story before the the script started to change uh dramatically so uh it's nice to be able to go back and and look at that and i've never seen that one before i've seen different ones well, not that one interesting uh, Jim, any final thoughts you have uh, or that you want to let people um, think about as, as we wrap this up and uh, promote Transformers, the visual history by one Mr. Jim Sorensen? Uh, well, I guess I'd just say that I really love this sort of material and I love putting together books like this. And if it's something that, that you love too, you know, to see, to read, to engage with, you know, just, you know, let me know, hit me up on on. Social media. I'm on. I'm on Facebook, uh, Twitter a little bit, and you know, drop me a line if it's something that you're passionate about. You know, let other people know. Reviews, good or bad, you know, always help. You know, no such thing as bad publicity. You know, let IDW know. Let Viz know. Let Hasbro know that this is something that you're interested in. That this is something that you like to engage with. Um, you know, keep the conversational ball rolling because it it really helps. Uh, do you have any tour dates? Um, I don't have any conventions that I'm allowed to talk about yet. I hope to be on the road as much in 2020 as I was in 2019. You know, 2019, I did New York Comic Con. I did TF Nation in, in Birmingham. I did the TF Con in, um, in Burbank. So I, I, I don't know or can't talk about exactly what I'll be doing next year. And, and certainly it's not all set yet, but... You know, I'd I'd love to you know interact with as, as many fans as I can. I always have a, a blast at these cons. So um, you know, again, it's if it's something you're interested in, you might want to let the convention organizers know. <laughs> it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. Definitely. 
I'm thinking about starting a show in just in my house, just called RickCon, <laughs> and it's just it's just like maybe like a few people, like four or five people. So okay. uh, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll see if uh, I'll talk to your agent. Yeah, talk to my agent, out. and you know, I'm yeah. I'm I'm usually a pretty cheap guest as long as you cover the flights and the housing. Yeah. You know, my appearance fee is very reasonable. Yeah. Well, I got a large bed. We can share. You know. <laughs> there, you yeah. there you go. So, always always a pleasure, guys. J- Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. You're very welcome. Yeah, I appreciate uh, it. I highly recommend the book. Uh, please go out and get it. Yeah, yeah, it's available on on Amazon or your favorite uh, bookseller. Yeah, Sorry. your local comic store would be happy to order it for you. Absolutely. Is there is there an electronic version of this as well, or is it just in hardback right now? As far as I know, it's uh, just in hardback right now. There's no softback or um, electronic version plan that that I'm aware of. Okay. So, but yeah, I know, uh, I know this is a, a wonderful coffee table ver- uh, book, um, and I've really been enjoying it as well. So, so thank you again. You're very welcome. Thank you, Jim. All right. See you. Wreck and roll. Yeah. <laughs>